All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Good whatever time thing. Uh, so this is uh, Declarative Pipeline State of the Union. Uh, my apologies for it not actually being tips, tricks, and gotchas. We, as we were actually writing the talk, we realized we'd actually done way too much in Declarative this year that we wanted to talk about. And so it's going to be mainly talking about the new stuff in Declarative. Uh, so who are we? Uh, I'm Andrew. Uh, I've been a Jenkins contributor for a decently large portion of my life, uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, and I'm a pipeline hacker at CloudBees. And? I'm Robert Sandell, AKA Bobby. I've been around <laughs> Jenkins community since 2010. So I'm a bit younger than Andrew. I'm a software engineer at CloudBees, hacking on various pipeline stuff at the moment. Uh, working out of my home office in Sweden while Andrew is in somewhere in Boston. Uh, my office mates are my two cats. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so what are we going to talk about? As Andrew said, we are going to talk about declarative pipeline, which is the structured, opinionated way to write your pipelines. That's the opposite of the scripted pipeline. Uh, we're going to mostly go through all the things that are happened in Declarative the last year. Uh, take a look at some of our new features. Hopefully, manage to get some tips and tricks in there as well. Uh, and look a short while into the future as well. And some of your questions as well. So let's start off with a quick overview of what happened during the last year. We've had 11 releases, almost one per month. Uh, had a lot of bug fixes, a couple of features, a couple of big ones, a lot of small ones. Um, uh, 1.2 was released in September, right after Jenkins World last year, where we introduced the parallel stages. We had a major internal rewrite uh, and we actually talked about all of those things last year. So if you weren't here, jump on YouTube and watch that. <laughs> uh, 126 came out in January. Uh, that's when we added options for individual stages. Uh, we also provided the input before a stage executes. Uh, so an example of how to put options inside a stage is like you do on the normal pipeline level, but here you can actually add a timeout, for example, uh, around an entire stage. That, that could be really handy for things like uh, if you need to wait, you're waiting for an agent to come up and the agent never actually gets provisioned, you can still have that individual stage get timed out and eventually have the build get killed so that you're not sitting there waiting forever for something. Yeah, uh, the input, that's, so that runs before the actual everything in the stage, except for the options, but before the agent, before all the when conditions. So the top, if you have an agent none uh, at the top level, and then you're waiting for an agent inside a stage, you can actually do the input before you allocate the agent. Which means you can have an input that's waiting for someone to approve it to go on to the next stage of like deployment without eating up an executor on an agent for 18 hours you know, or through the whole weekend or something. And here you can see the example. Uh, so it's a separate directive on the actual stage. Uh, the Parameters are mapped sort of verbatim on top of the normal input step for those that have used it in scripted before. Uh, so it's pretty easy to use. Uh, a couple other nice bits that the input uh, directive adds is that uh, if you're passing parameters to your input, if you're not just doing yes, no, you know, continue, kill, uh, the values, the parameter values, uh, will be made available in the environment for that stage and any stages that may be nested within it. 
so that you can pass information into your pipeline as it's running and have it available uh, for the scope of that execution. So that's, that's something that you have to, with uh, the input step and scripted, you have to capture that by hand and then make sure you add that yourself. But with declarative, it will do that for you. Okay, one to eight and one to nine came out in April. That's when we added a couple of new post conditions. Uh, we added the declarative directive generator, which we're gonna deep dive later into. We added uh, two new when conditions, tag and change requests. Also gonna deep dive into that a bit later on. Um, so the post conditions, uh, we have cleanup that is a post condition that will always run. It doesn't matter what the status of the build is. Fixed uh, runs if we are successful now, but previously we were failure or unstable. The regression is the other way around. The previous build was success, but now we've had some problems. Yeah, I, I, I should mention here, cleanup is kind of the flip of the existing always condition. Always unsurprisingly always runs, but it runs before any of the other post conditions, before failure, success, fixed, regression, et cetera. Uh, cleanup runs after all of the other post conditions. So if you need to be sure that you're wiping a directory at the end of your stage or your build, or you need to deprovision something, but you still need it to be up when you're doing your success, uh, that's a, something that cleanup can help with. And uh, fixed and regression, are far superior versions of the existing changed post condition, which was kind of terrible, and I apologize for it. Uh, fixed and regression, I think, I think are much more useful. Okay, 1.3 came out in June. That's where we added sequential stages. Gonna deep dive into that a bit later on. Uh, and also added a restart. Uh, of a build from a specific stage. Also gonna show, do a deep dive in, into that as well. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to that, uh, I promise. <laughs> so Andrew can have the clicker now. I get the clicker. <laughs> All right, so uh, the declarative directive generator. Uh, who here has used the pipeline snippet generator? Yeah, me too. Uh, it's a godsend. It is, even for those of us who work on Pipeline and have been working on Jenkins for nearly a quarter of our lives, uh, don't always remember every option, everything that's available, especially on a specific master. And we don't remember the, necessarily remember the exact syntax for everything, so being able to go fill out a form and get a generated, uh, uh, well, snippet is really helpful. And we had the idea, wait, what? maybe we could do the same kind of thing for generating the declarative directives. I mean, the directives are simpler than a lot of uh, steps. There's, well, less of them than there are steps. Uh, they're more structured, there's the validation, so it's harder to, to, it's easier to figure out when you've done something wrong, but still you may not know what all of the options for a stage are, or uh, all of the agent types that are available on your master. And so for that we created the declarative directive generator. Yes, it's kind of a kludgy name. I tend to give things long names. I apologize. Uh, so yeah, it allows you to do basically the same thing as the snippet generator, configuring a declarative direct, uh, direction? Directive uh, through a form, and it'll generate uh, the declarative code that you can then copy into your Jenkins file, uh, generally. There's a couple of them where it just gives you stuff you have to uncomment and figure out what to do but it can help you learn the syntax for declarative and see what's available for use on your Jenkins instance. So here's how you find it. You go to any uh, pipeline project uh, or multi-branch project or org folder, et cetera. There'll be a pipeline syntax link in the side panel, same way you would get to the snippet generator. And then on the side panel from the snippet generator, there is a new link there, uh, well two, there's also the online documentation for declarative, but there's the directive generator link. So we didn't give it its own link. We thought that would be fine because it's part of pipeline syntax. Hopefully that's easy enough to find. Uh, so what does it look like? Uh, again, 
it pretty much looks the same as a snippet generator or classic uh, Jenkins job configuration because, well, that's the framework we're working in. Uh, you choose which directive you want to uh, fill out, and then you will get to see, you will get to configure the directive and choose, uh, here I get to choose one or more options uh, from the list that uh, are available on this master. Then I can configure each of those options. So here I'm configuring discard old builds. Uh, and I'm specifying how many days, how many, the maximum number of builds to keep. And then I'm clicking on, down there in the corner, generate declarative directive. And then, ta-da, it creates an overly verbose string. Uh, in practice, uh, I mean, you may have noticed this with the snippet generator, that it will populate every argument in the, uh, uh, the, the step, even if your value for that is an empty string or null. So if you see empty strings, you can often just ignore them. But this will give you that valid syntax that you can just copy in, and it will work, and it will do what you need, and you don't have to uh, guess. So that's good. Next up, we've got the tag and change request when conditions, which Bobby's going to talk about. Yeah, that's my baby. <laughs> so we added, we added a couple last year, a couple of new when conditions. Uh, they weren't really a big hit, so I think these ones are a lot better. Um, so the branch API plugin, which is the one that is taking care of the Jenkins files or the API for the Jenkins files that can create all these uh, sub jobs inside your folders, added a new couple of environment variables. Uh, the uh, change something and the tag something environment variables. It used to have only the branch name that it populated for what happened, but now it's added a bit more. So even though you didn't upgrade declarative, you could potentially have used our environment when condition to look at these, like when the change author email environment variable is whoever we want to do something. Um, but these new ones that, that has been added are a bit more expressive and, yeah, basically allows you to do a bit more rich checking of it. So the tag when condition is very similar to branch. It works the same way. So if, if you're building the example we have here, if you're building on a, uh, if you're building a tag that matches release dash something, uh, the stage would run. Uh, unfortunately, due to how Groovy handles things like optional and non-optional parameters, if you w just want to run for any tag, we added a separate uh, when condition for that that is called building tag, but that's the same one as if you were to say when tag empty string, but it's a bit nicer to just ask for building tag. Uh, change request is a uh, is the sort of what branch API calls the general sort of in GitHub it's called a pull request in GitLab it's called a merge request if you're a Garrett user it's called a change request there so it's sort of settled on uh, calling it change request uh, so that can that's how you can control if the, chain, if the stage should execute if you're building a, P, a pull request, for example. Um, so, I, for example, you might only care about static analysis on pull requests, or you might care about doing fast feedback to the, uh, to the developers, so you, will, you should not perhaps run the big performance tests if, if it's a change request. So, you can combine this, of course, with the not or the all of and all, all those things that are available as well. So if, if it's not a change request, you can run the performance tests. Um, and of course, the, it's adding uh, a lot of other stuff that you can change as well. Um, there is the ID of the PR. I have no idea why you would use that, but it was there. It took a minute to add, so I added it. You have the, the target branch you can check. 
So if, we're, or if the pull request is targeting the master branch, for example, you could run a set of stages, or if it's targeting a feature branch, you might want to skip some stuff. Uh, the origin branch, not sure what that's usually, sort of what you should use that for, but that's the name of the, of the fork. The fork is just a true false value if it's coming in from a fork or not. Uh, the URL of the change, the title could be quite handy if you need to inform the, the pipeline of some stuff. The title could perhaps, for example, contain the <laughs> ticket number in JIRA and you might have a stage that moves that ticket to something. So you could find that in the title. Um, the author, uh, the author display name, that's just the name. The author is the name plus the email. And then you have the author email. So you could, for example, if the CTO is uh, pushing pull requests at late in the evening, you might want to send an email to the CEO or something. I don't know. Stay away from our code. <laughs> um, so when we did branch uh, originally, uh, we used ant style globs. It's these like some star star path slash star dot XML or whatever. It's used all over in Jenkins. And I find them quite powerful. And even though they are quite easy to use. So they, they were quite natural to add for a branch. And also now that we did tag, uh, that's also by default working with the ant style glob pattern of, of comparing. But it's not usable at all to compare th things like URLs and email addresses. It just bails out and doesn't know a thing. Um, so we added a comparator parameter to, uh, at the moment it's for change request and tag, where you can specify how the value that you're checking, how should it be compared to the actual value. So simple string comparison, the ant style glob, uh, or a regular expression. We might come up with something cool in the, later on, like lenient string comparison, or I don't know. Um, but my hope is that I will get some time during the coming years so that I can add this comparator parameter to all the other one conditions that we, that we have some kind of uniformity. But at the moment, it's only available on change request and tag. We can actually tell it to, this is a regular expression and not an ant style glob. Here's Andrew again. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think there's also some synergy here between what uh, Bobby was just talking about and the directive generator. And that I know I saw some of you trying to scribble down all of the new fields you can compare and check against. And well, you can use the directive generator to see what's available uh, for when conditions, for each of the when conditions fields, and uh, what the exact syntax is, et cetera. So I think that, that's, a, I think, a really good example of why we added the directive generator so that you can have more complex and powerful expressions uh, without having to memorize everything. Um, but now, sequential stages. Um, who here was at our talk last year? Uh, cool. Do you remember us introducing parallel stages? Uh, who here has been using parallel stages? Great. Uh, so one thing that we uh, have wanted to do for a while after that was add sequential stages, which I have never come up with a better name for, and since it's alliterative, it's stuck. But the idea is that within a parent stage, rather than listing stages to run in parallel, you can list stages to run sequentially, one after the other. Uh, it's very similar to parallel, except there's some differences. You can, for example, nest sequential stages inside a parallel stage. So you can run build, test, deploy on two different platforms and not just have to have one giant stage for Linux and one for Windows. Uh, you can specify an agent or tools as well as when input options, etc., on the parent of sequential stages so that you can have five stages that run in a row that all share the same agent, 
but it isn't the top level agent. So you can group your stages more logically and more functionally, uh, which I think, especially when combined with stuff like input, uh, really uh, creates some new and really uh, interesting opportunities for uh, expressiveness and uh, functionality. So let's look at uh, why you should use it. Uh, well, yeah, build, test, deploy on multiple platforms. Uh, that's the original motivation for this was that, that people wanted to have more clarity within their stages. But I, I, like I said, I really think that the logical grouping is something that opens up a lot of opportunities. And then, of course, there's just the ability to not repeat yourself. If you've got three of your stages that need to use the same environment variable, but for whatever reason, or, or that uh, are all executing when you're on a change request, but not when you're on master or vice versa, it'd be nice to be able to not have to copy and paste that when condition to all three stages. So why not nest them in a parent stage that has the when condition? So as uh, this, can you guys see this decently enough? The slides are uh, gonna be available online, et cetera. So it's, I love declarative syntax, uh, probably more than it's healthy, but my God, it does use new lines a lot. Um, so it, it is uh, difficult to fit on slides. Uh, so the example here has, uh, hold on a sec, yeah. So here we're not doing parallel, we're just doing uh, the group stage. So we have an agent none at the top level. So we're not, when the build starts, it's not eating up an executor. It's not keeping one executor for the entire run of the build. But its build and test stages are wrapped up as sequential stages within a parent that does have a Docker, our build tools image agent. So those will run on the same agent in the same executor in the same workspace. You could approximate some of this uh, without sequential stages. You could stash stuff. You could hope you get the same executor again on the next stage, but you didn't have guarantees. Now you have that guarantee. You're not leaving the agent and coming back to it. You're using the same agent for both of those stages. Uh, and then we're gonna stash our artifacts at the end because after we finish build and test, we're gonna move to waiting for input. We want to find out whether or not we should actually deploy this. And, you know, people are lazy. People take time to see things and click them, so it might be a while. We don't want to eat up the agent executor uh, for that whole time, either because there may be other builds that need to use it, or we don't want to pay for it, or whatever. So instead, we will uh, sit here waiting without using an executor. And then once we confirm, we'll get a new agent and do the deploy on there. So uh, it's an example of that use case. And then this is how it'll visualize in, uh, well, for lack of a better word, since yeah, we're supposed to diminish calling it blue ocean because it's being built to In the visualization that is prettier than the old Jenkins one, um, we first have the, we, we still have some tweaks. We're still evolving exactly what this visualization is. So it, right now it's a little odd sometimes. So it does visualize the parent stage here, even though it's not doing anything. But then we've got build test and deploy. So even though we've got the stage nested, it's still visualizing linearly because in practice, that's what you're doing. You're running stages in a row. Uh, and that's also showing the input uh, directive doing what it's supposed to do because we hit that input and we're waiting for that for now. Let's proceed. And that's something we're gonna come back to. That's the restart stages. Uh, parallel, yes, another maze of spaghetti. Um, so here we've got a parallel stage and we've got both a CentOS uh, block and an Ubuntu stage. So we've, we're running the same thing more or less on both CentOS and Ubuntu, but we're running multiple stages inside each of those. We're running build and deploy on both CentOS and on Ubuntu. Uh, so we've got the nested stages there within the parallel. Uh, and the result of that is a visualization like this, uh, where uh, we've got a different when condition uh, on each of the branches. Uh, and, and on, so for, I was just ginning up a random example. But so we're only running deploy on CentOS if we're on some branch, while we're running deploy on Ubuntu if we're on master. Uh, but the result is that we get this linear, uh, 
you know, visualization of each of the branches, of each of the parallel branches. We still need some UI work here and there so it's clear which one CentOS and Ubuntu, but we're working on that. This is all an evolving thingy stuff, but yeah. So, stage restart. That's the other, uh, the last of the really big features that we've rolled out in the last year. Um, and it is a declarative pipeline only feature. Uh, there is a proprietary equivalent for scripted that you can get for as part of Cloud Beast Core, give us money please. Uh, but uh, stage restart is part of declarative, it's open source, it works with your existing pipelines as long as they're declarative. It allows you to go to any restart, to, to any completed declarative pipeline build, pick a stage in that completed build and restart the build from that stage. Uh, you'll get the same SCM revision and parameters uh, as the original build so that you'll still have the same environment. You'll be rebuilding the same stuff. Uh, it will skip the execution of every stage until the stage you chose to restart from. Uh, and then it'll run as normal from that point onward. It'll be a new build, but... Uh, and if you're planning to really maximize using, uh, using this, you're going to want to start using Stash, which will copy aside artifacts... Uh, or anything from the file system during your build and then allow you to unstash them later in your build. Normally, stashes get wiped when your build completes, so you need to use a, a, a configuration parameter that I'll touch on in a moment to make sure that your stashes are preserved across restarted builds, but you can then unstash something you stashed in the previous build uh, with your restart. Uh, so yeah, except for preserving stashes, there's no additional configuration needed to do stage restart. It is just a built-in uh, piece of functionality and declarative. It only works uh, at stage boundaries. You can't restart partway through a stage. You can't restart uh, any stage except a top level stage because yeah, trying to figure out how to do a restart of parallel stages and which ones you restart, yeah, we're not going there. That's too, too weird and edgy. Uh, but it works for, you, your pipeline has to complete, your build has to finish before you can restart. And you can restart either from the classic UI in a crappy little thing I put together or much better in the Blue Ocean UI. Uh, so why should you use it? Uh, let's say your test stage fails because the service that you're depending on, that you're running uh, against is down and it's not actually a problem with your code you've already spent half an hour building or doing some other kind of tests, and you just want to start over from that point. Uh, the, honestly, I had trouble coming up with concrete examples because my brain was fried, but I'm sure that you can come up with creative use cases for this. Uh, network issues, all kinds of flakiness. Uh, perhaps you just, you, you are curious and want to see what happens when you run things again. I don't know. Uh, so, I mentioned uh, preserve stashes. Uh, it's a, an option for the top level that lets you set how many builds worth of stashes to keep. You don't want to set it too stupidly high because that's disk usage that you're keeping on the master, et cetera. But you do need to explicitly specify that if you want to be able to unstash in your restarted build. So that is the one thing that you do have to configure. I apologize that I couldn't make that magic. Uh, so how do you restart from a stage? You click the thing that says restart and then stage name. Uh, it's really that simple. Uh, for when you're looking at a uh, parallel stage or a sequential stage, it'll show the uh, parent of the stage here instead. And all you do is click that and it just happens. Uh, and in the visualization, the result is that the stages that are skipped just get grayed out. Uh, again, I mentioned that parent stages are a little weird in visualization, so ignore that green one there. Uh, but so last time, you know, we saw that uh, it wasn't doing anything. But this time we see that uh, we're uh, restoring artifacts that uh, we'd previously stashed, and then we're running our deploy so that we're able to reuse the, the stuff we already built and tested that we knew was good, but somebody hit the wrong button when they meant to deploy, and well, that was silly. So, ta-da. Uh, <clears throat> no, I just wanted to add that flakiness and stuff like that, just because you can restart the stage shouldn't sort of hinder you from using the retry option. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there, you can always rerun the full build. Uh, yes? Yes, uh, the question was whether restarting a stage affects the build number. It does. It creates a whole new build. Uh, I wish I could have done it differently, but that's just at the core. We're stuck with that as an architectural aspect of Jenkins. So if you're using your build number as a source of truth for something, it will no longer be the same thing. So stage restart's only been out in the wild since June. So it's a pretty new feature, and we're still figuring out uh, and learning how you guys are actually wanting to use it, what you're actually trying to do with it, what changes we may need to make to enable that. For example, one request that I think we're probably gonna do fairly soon is adding the ability to mark some stages, mark a stage as saying, even if I should, um, you're restarting from a later stage, run me anyway. You know, a, a setup stage that has to get run even on a restart. So if there's some configuration you need to do on your restart. Uh, there's, and we want to know more. This is, it feels to me like a really uh, wide open space and I really want to see where we can go with it and what would be useful for everybody. So please let us know, open tickets, vote on tickets. Uh, for I can't promise we're going to do everything because we're not going to do everything, but how am I supposed to know what we should work on if you guys don't tell us? So, uh, got a couple tips and tricks that we're going to have to run through fairly quickly because we don't have a lot of time and I want to make sure we have time for questions. Who here uses script? Please don't. <laughs> you, you're setting yourself up for problems someday. Uh, script is a bad code smell. Uh, it's not always a bad thing, but if you feel the need to escape the uh, structure of declarative, I, want, I think you should really think about whether you needed to do that. Is there a better way you could do it? Could you be putting it in a shared library if it's something that you're, especially if it's something you're doing across multiple Jenkins files? Uh, are you, and is it just a syntax thing? Uh, try to avoid it. but. If you have to, you can use it, and it's cousin when expression. Uh, they are escape patches, they do exist, they allow you to do raw scripted code in declarative, but you're not getting as much value out of declarative that way. Um, you're making me sad. Uh, and down the road, maybe with, as we have more, uh, more offerings that, of places that we want to be able to migrate pipelines across, say CodeShip, Jenkins X, Jenkins, CloudBeast Core, et cetera, et cetera, uh, there wouldn't necessarily be as many guarantees of portability for script because it depends on the underlying implementation. And still try to avoid variables that are persistent across stages. I have some vague ideas for some stuff there, but anyway. Uh, who here is using shared libraries? That's fantastic. Who here uh, is happy about using shared libraries? That's a pretty good ratio. I'm good with that. Uh, yeah, you should be using shared libraries if you're copying code around. I mean, it's that simple. It's a good way to encapsulate, to reuse, uh, to use a more advanced and expressive scripted pipeline inside declarative pipelines without, especially if you're like a shared services person or a Jenkins admin, it lets you have more powerful stuff that you expose to your devs for writing the Jenkins files without unleashing the whole world. Uh, and one last little tip. Uh, I added an equals condition this year because I was discovering lots of tickets where people were doing when expression if foo equals bar. You don't actually need to do that the, 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 anymore. The, there's an equals condition. All it does is do return true if the two things are equal, but it's just, you, so you can do that. Uh, so quickly looking to the future. Uh, who here's used the matrix project type in Jenkins, the classic matrix project type? Multi-configuration project, yeah, multi -configura whatever it's yeah. called. <laughs> Where you define your, prod, your build, and then you also define a set of uh, axes, of variables that could have uh, multiple potential values, and it will run, it, it will generate you know, each combination of those possible values and run the build with those values, those combinations, in parallel. So you'll get 18,000 different permutations and it'll run them all at once uh, without you having to have, say, here's my Windows build, here's my, 
Mac build, here's my Linux build, and copy paste repeatedly. Now that we've got sequential stages and parallel stages and the visualization and declarative, uh, we have the ability to provide a matrix syntax in declarative so that you could say, I want to run these stages for each of these combinations. So you don't have to copy paste, you don't have to script a way to generate stages. Uh, we're working on the syntax design. We should have a, Je a Jenkins enhancement proposal uh, doc up for review later this fall, hoping to get this end of year, be early next year. This has been a holy grail for me for a couple years, and we finally have all the pieces to do it right, and so I'm really excited about that. Uh, a little thing that crossed my mind recently when I was seeing things like the uh, people doing if current build dot result equals success when they could be using equals uh, in, in the when condition was inspect, automatically inspecting the Jenkins file uh, at compile time and looking for script blocks and when expressions that you don't need to use, where there is a pure declarative way to use them and then Doing a compile time warning, not, not an error. I would not break you. That's rude. Uh, highlighting those patterns and saying, hey, you could do this instead, and then linking to uh, documentation that would point out, here's how you would translate from this to this. Here's how you could make your pipeline more pure declarative, more reliable, uh, less idiosyncratic, less twitchy. Um, this, is, I mean, this may not actually end up being that big, but it's, a, it, it's something I think could be interesting and could be handy. Uh, so we're currently gathering uh, patterns and, and, and solutions for those patterns. So I don't know if or when this will actually happen, but I think it would be, uh, well, fun to implement, and I think it would be kind of useful. Um, all right, so now we're to the uh, main part. Uh, questions? Yes. Uh, so actually I have two small questions. All right. Yes. Um, is that essentially what's going to be specific for uh, dynamic parallel stages? Yeah, so the question was uh, whether matrix, uh, the, the planned matrix syntax will be uh, a fix for dynamic parallel stages. I think so. It, I mean, it, it's, I think that it's, it will solve a lot of the use cases where currently the only way to do that is dynamically generating parallel stages. It won't be perfect. I mean, there's always going to be some edge case where you actually need to mutate things differently. Um, but the goal is to make it so that uh, there, we, we cover m most of those scenarios. Yes? Yeah, so the question was about testing of, well, pipeline in general, really. Yeah. And yeah, it's kind of mediocre. There's a talk, I don't remember exactly when, but there's a talk uh, today, uh, sometime today or tomorrow, uh, about uh, a pipeline uh, SPOC framework, a, a spec approach to testing for pipeline uh, that I think is worth seeing. Uh, I have looked, I, I, I've uh, had some access in looking into uh, the implementation a few months ago uh, before it was open sourced by HomeAway, and it looks really, really good. I think that it's uh, a lot more user friendly than the previous approaches to pipeline unit testing have been, um, but it's still not perfect. The, uh, if you were at the keynote, you heard Koske talk about the uh, goal of a new execution engine behind the scenes for pipeline that will be simpler. Uh, that would also uh, enable being able to use pretty much any standard groovy Java unit test stuff without Jenkins specific magic. Uh, but that's not in the immediate future. But uh, yeah, look for the talk about uh, unit testing. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was basically, would uh, a useful uh, scenario for stage restart be basically uh, uh, replacing input uh, to say, okay, run until we get to build and test, and then end. 
but then we can go look at it later and say, okay, so here's the artifacts we stashed from this. Now we can pick back up from this point where we already have our artifacts, we already built and test, we already know it's good. Now go do a deploy. Yes, that, that is a scenario that could work. Uh, it probably would uh, do best with some more polish and uh, uh, maybe some customization and additional uh, syntax and sugar for that kind of scenario, but that's exactly the kind of thing that, I'm, um, that we're looking to hear so we can build out for that kind of use case. Yes, there, there is a connection. Uh, yeah, it does track the relationship between the original build and the restarted build. Not much is using that relationship right now other than the internal execution, but that does exist. Uh, yes? So uh, the question is, if I'm already on scripted, should I move to declarative? Uh, should I stay? What is the, you know, what's the roadmap? It's a good question. We're not gonna stop supporting uh, scripted. I've been saying that since the first declarative talk two years ago, uh, is scripted is gonna be around. Uh, so you're not going to lose anything. Uh, you're not going to get broken by staying on scripted. Uh, if you've already got a whole ton of uh, scripted pipelines and you've already got the experience and knowledge and skill set within your group and within your, the people who are maintaining your jobs to do that well, there's no reason to go to declarative. I mean, that stage restart is literally the first feature, uh, first aspect of declarative that is a functional pipeline thing that is only in declarative. Everything else is just... Uh, Sugar. A better syntax, more validation, easier to use, more opinionated, more default built-in you know, behaviors. But you could do everything else. Uh, and if you uh, pay CloudBees for CloudBees Core, you can do checkpoints in uh, uh, scripted. Uh, if you're already good with scripted, stay on scripted. The, there's no need to change what already works for you. Uh, you can also, but if you're getting a scale where things are becoming diff more difficult to maintain, uh, you're ramping up more users uh, who are not as familiar with Pipeline and with Jenkins, uh, who, but still need to have their own Jenkins files for each project. Then I would say think seriously about moving to more of your logic into shared libraries, because I think that declarative is going to be easier for someone whose job, who, who is not a Jenkins person as their full-time job, um, to be able to pick up and do what they need to do on that scale. Uh, one more question. Uh, um, couple of, you might not see them because of the yes. lights. <laughs> uh, yes. All right, so the questions was, uh, the, the two questions were about uh, whether it was possible to do a kind of templating of Jenkins files uh, with replacing values in them uh, at execution time and about uh, compliance, about uh, mandating that certain things happen in, uh, in the pipelines that your users are authoring. CloudBees Core. Uh, that's actually, uh, pipeline templating is what I've been working on for most of the last few months as a large chunk of my time. Uh, it's still uh, relatively early and uh, we plan to expand it, but that's definitely the direction we're going. Uh, for compliance type stuff, I mean, we gotta get paid. Uh, so uh, that's, that, that area is gonna be proprietary features, uh, but uh, I like getting paid, so. Uh, we'll have more on that soon. The, the, the pipeline templates work that's underway at CloudBees is scripted or declarative. It is pipeline agnostic currently. We will probably eventually have some declarative only uh, features for things like composition and inheritance that are a lot harder to do in scripted than they are in declarative, but that's not in the current uh, stuff. All right, uh, it is noon, uh, so thank you all very much.
enjoy the rest of the conference, and yeah, bye. And if you have any more questions, we'll be down in the, com in the community booth in the expo hall if you have any further questions.